Praise God. I'll just tell you right up front, the title of my message this morning is Just If I'd Not Sinned. Just If I'd Not Sinned. There was a discussion last Sunday morning in Sunday school. It, um, there were several, there have been several discussions since Sunday school. Several people have approached me and discussions have ensued regarding a topic in Sunday school. Consequently, I feel the need to address a fundamental doctrine of the Christian faith. Fundamental to our Christian faith is the doctrine of justification. I'll tell you this, as I got into this this week and studied, I, I know the doctrine, I believe the doctrine, and, and as, I put, as, as I was putting notes together to try and, uh, you know, to, to preach and teach on this, you know, when I sit down to write my sermon, my handwritten notes, I know about five pages of my handwritten notes will be about 35, 40 minutes, which is, for most of you, an acceptable length of time. For the rest of you, I can't help you. But as I was putting my notes together, uh, I was on eight pages and just got started. So um, sit back and relax. <laughs> okay. I, I will, I'll do my best. Justification is not a topic that you can just get in and get out of. Um, but I, I do, I, I've tried to condense it and I've tried to make it as clear as I can. If, you're taking, if you've ever taken notes, now would be a good time to take notes um, on this message this morning. To justify, Noah Webster says, in theology, to pardon and clear from guilt, to absolve or acquit from guilt and merited punishment, and to accept as righteous on account of the merits of the Savior, or by the application of Christ's atonement to the offender. That's the definition, according to Noah Webster, of to justify. Now, we're going to break this down and uh, make application of this biblical truth as best we could this morning. Again, as always, the only thing that matters this morning... The only thing that really we, we care about, the only thing that we must be interested in is what God's word says. Not Amen. traditions of men, not opinions of men, uh, no matter how many men and no matter how old the traditions. The only thing that matters is what God's eternal word says on this subject. Would you agree with me? Amen. I want to use Romans chapter 5 as our text, and I'd ask you to please turn there and stand with me as we honor the reading of God's Word. Romans chapter 5. As we begin this, I will be honest with you, as we read this, um, it's, not, it's not an easy read in the King James Bible. I understand that. But go along with me, and I, will, I hope to make it... Uh, clear as I begin to preach. Romans <clears throat> chapter 5, <clears throat> excuse me, beginning at verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man someone even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. 
For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. That word is reconciliation. Wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law was in the world... Uh, until, the law, uh, until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one, many be dead, much more. The grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift, for the judgment was by one to condemnation. But the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more, they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Father, we thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for Jesus Christ, for the righteous of God. Thank you, Lord, for the Holy One. Thank you for the Son of God, the sinless, perfect Redeemer who has come, Lord, to justify us before God, to purchase for us our eternal life. Holy Spirit of God, I beg of you, Help me today, Lord, to proclaim this word. Help me today, God, to make it clear to your people. Help us, God, to receive today the truth of your word and to find it, uh, uh, let it find its place in our hearts and lives. God, help us to be clear in our understanding of just what Jesus has done for us. God, let us, I pray, give all the glory and honor to Jesus. I ask this in that name above all names, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Justified, not sinned. The first thing I want to talk about this morning is the law. Um, some of you perhaps have not grown up in a Christian church. Uh, you, you may not have a full understanding of the law. When people talk about the law, what exactly does the law mean? What is the law? See, it's, it's, it's pertinent. It's, 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 it's of utmost importance that we understand what the law is before we could even understand what justification is. Now, when we talk about the law, in general terms, the law, um, is it good or bad? Don't answer yet. Is the law good or is it bad? Now in Christian circles, we have over, well, I won't say overemphasized, but we have emphasized so much the, the scripture verse, and we could all quote it, we are no, we're not under law, but under grace. And thank God we are. But we have spoken that and quoted that scripture so much, we have emphasized the fact that we as a church are no longer under law, but we are now under grace to the point where somebody listening or, or, or somebody might think that the law was something bad. The law was something, we, oh, we're not under law anymore. Thank God we're not under law. We're on, now we're under grace. And so somebody hearing that might say, well, that law was terrible. 
The law is a bad thing. It's an evil thing if, if we're so happy to not be under it anymore. But listen, listen to what the Word of God says about the law. There's nothing wrong with the law. Amen. There's absolutely nothing wrong with the law. Listen to what Paul said in Romans 7, 12. The law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. The law of God is good. Now don't answer this unless you are willing to maybe be embarrassed. Okay, if you're sure of this answer, then, then go ahead and answer. Otherwise, just listen. When God gave man his law, when God gave God's law to man, did he expect us to keep it? When God said, thou shalt, and thou shalt not, did he expect us to keep his law? The correct answer is no. God is sovereign. God is omniscient. He knows all things. He knows that we, when he gave us the law, he was fully aware that man would not, indeed could not, keep his law. So why then would a sovereign God, why then would a holy God, the creator of all that is, why would he then give us a law that he knew we could not keep and then hold us accountable for keeping it? We'll come back to that in just a moment. What is the law? Well, in general terms, the law is the Torah or the Pentateuch, or the first five books of the Bible, also known as the Law of Moses. Um, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. It's the Law, or the five books of Moses, the Law of Moses. Um, in, the, in the Law, God was telling Moses to, to tell the Jews how they were to live. It includes the ceremonial law of Leviticus. You ever read Leviticus? Let me tell you something, Leviticus, just, it, 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 Leviticus, it, it put this, just put this in mind, put the filter on, okay? Here, here's the filter when you read Leviticus, Jesus Christ. And when you read Leviticus with the filter of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, the blood of the Lamb, uh, you see Leviticus in a whole new way. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ in typology. But in Leviticus is the ceremonial law, uh, dealing with what you should eat, how you should eat it, um, how you should dress, attire, how men should dress, how women should dress. Uh, it, it has to do with uh, how to cleanse, how to be clean, how to clean your house, how to clean your body, how to clean your clothes, how to clean everything. Um, what you, the, the, the worship, how to worship. How, what, you should, what you should use for worship. It's all ceremonial law. In essence, God was telling uh, Moses how the Jews were to live a holy life. And so they had the ceremonial law, which had to do with every detail of life. Now, what the Jews did was, are you still with me? Amen. Just raise your hand if I bore you. What the Jews did, what the Pharisees did, was they took these five books of the law and they created 613 uh, laws called the Talmud. The Torah, or the Old Testament law, the five books of Moses, now became 613 laws. And, and, and Jesus rebuked the Pharisees, by the way, when he came and said, You Pharisees, you've, you've, you've put laws upon the people that you yourself can't fill. For instance, just... Just go with me for a minute, just so I can explain this. Um, the Bible said, you know, the, 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 the law, the Torah said that you, you, know, you, you could only travel a certain distance on the Sabbath day. And so what the Pharisees said was a Sabbath day's journey. What's a Sabbath day's journey? Well, we know what the Sabbath is and, and we know what a day is. Well, a Sabbath day's journey was the distance you could travel on the Sabbath day without breaking the law. Well, well okay, well, how far is that? Well, f about 1,500 feet from home. Okay, so, well, what constitutes home? Well, home is a place where you eat a meal. So what is a meal? Well, something to drink and something to eat. 
So bread and water would be a meal. Okay. So here's what. So now, if you wanted to travel some distance on the Sabbath day, uh, according to the Talmud, you would you would take some bread and some water, and you would place it every 1,500 feet uh, somewhere during the week, so that on the Sabbath day, you could travel from home to your bread and water, which was home, and you could travel another 1,500 feet to. Uh, bread and water and you were home again and so you could and they circumvented the law and all of this nonsense there, there was just so much burden upon the people and this is how the Jews were expected to live in order to please God the ceremonial law and then what what Jesus rebuked the Pharisees for was uh, was increasing the law uh, to show holiness uh, when we talk about the law, it also includes the Ten Commandments or the moral law of God. Thou shalt, thou shalt not. As Christians, we are more concerned with the moral law, with the Ten Commandments. You know, washing leprosy from your walls is probably not on the top ten of things you need to do this week. But we as Christians are, considered, are concerned with the moral law or the Ten Commandments. Paul, the apostle in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verses 7 and 8, he said, But if the ministration of death written and engraven in stones was glorious, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? Uh, this is, Paul is talking about the, the Ten Commandments. Remember, uh, Charlton Hess, no, Moses. <laughs> Remember when Moses went up the mountain to receive the law? And God, with his finger, wrote upon the tablets of stone the Ten Commandments. This is the ref Paul's making reference to, to the Ten Commandments here. But both ceremonial and moral law are included when we talk about the law. You still with me? Amen. I lose you? No. Everybody happy? Yeah. Okay. So we're talking here about, about the law. Is it good or is it bad? The law springs from the nature of God. When God says that we, we should be clean and we should be holy, all of these things, they come from the very nature of God. God is holy. And, and, and the law is stating things that he's saying, if you want to have fellowship with me, if you want to have a relationship with me, these are the things that you must do. You can't enter into my presence unless these things are, are done. And so it reveals the absolute holiness of God. To have fellowship with God, we would need to do all of these things. Now, the law was given to intensify man's knowledge of sin. Uh, Romans chapter 3, 19 and 20, Paul says, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. What does he say? What's Paul saying there? You come from out of state. You're coming down I-91. You see the exit for Route 15, the parkway. You're doing 65 miles an hour on 91. You pull off onto Route 15, you're doing 65 miles an hour. And you're thinking, nice day, right? I'm doing 60, uh, 65 was the last speed limit I saw. I'm doing 65, and you're perfectly content. You're, you, you have no concerns whatsoever. But a couple hundred yards down on the parkway, you see that sign that says 55 miles per hour. And all of a sudden, you realize, I'm speeding. You get the picture? You had no idea you were speeding. You were just moving along at 65 miles an hour, not a care in the world, until the law said, you're breaking the law. And when you saw that 55 miles an hour, hopefully you put on the brakes and you, you looked in your rearview mirror and looked around for lights. And... <laughs> but now you proceed at 55 miles an hour. Why? Because the law has told you that you were breaking the law. You didn't know it before. And that's what the law does. It steps into our lives and it tells us that we are breaking the law. It tells us that we are offending God. Romans 7, 7, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. 
Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet, for example. Paul's saying, I didn't know that I was involved in lust until the law told me that I shouldn't covet. And then I realized that what I was doing was coveting, and I realized that I was breaking the law. We wouldn't know what God requires of us unless the law told us, Thou shalt and thou shalt not. And it reveals to us that we are sinners. Romans 7, 9, Paul said, For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. When I read the law, when I heard the Ten Commandments, when I came to realize what Jesus, what God was requiring of me, I, I realized that I was a, a lost sinner and I was, I was dead spiritually. Still with me? Amen. The law didn't make me guilty. It revealed to me that I am guilty. This is why we must preach the law. Oh, Pastor, no, we're not under law. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. But until we come to Christ, we most certainly are. And I can tell you the good news this morning. I can tell you that Jesus saves. And unless you know that you're a sinner, you may say, save from what? Jesus is the good news. Well, it's only good news if you know the bad news. Jesus is the answer. Yeah, but I didn't ask any question. And so unless you know the bad news first, the good news isn't all that good. Amen. You know, Ray Comfort, uh, the way of the master, you know, he, he uses this illustration and I'll use it too. You know, imagine somebody says, I have a cure for cancer. You say, well, that's wonderful. That's good news. But if you don't have cancer, it's really, you know, it's good. But, it, but if you have cancer, then you, that cure for cancer is very good news. And you could say, well, Jesus came to save sinners. But if you don't know you're a sinner, pfft, it's good for my neighbor, but I'm fine. And so there, the law came that we might know. And that's why we must preach the law. We must give people the bad news first. Doesn't make, it's not going to build a church. It's not going to pack a church. No, strobe lights and smoke machines pack churches. But it's going to get people saved. We are all under law until we come to Christ. So that's a fine kettle of fish. So God has given us the Ten Commandments. He's given us the law. The law says, thou shalt, thou shalt not. We absolutely must kept, keep the law to be acceptable to God. It's impossible to keep them uh, the law 100% of the time. And, and uh, what a fine kettle of fish. <clears throat> What, how, what do I do about this? So, so wait a minute, Pastor, are you telling me that, <clears throat> that God has given us the law so that we can walk around feeling guilty all the time? The scholarly, biblical, theological answer? Yup. Yup. The law has come to show us our guilt before a holy God. Galatians 3 and 24, the Bible says, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster, to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. That word schoolmaster, pedagogue. I, I knew this this morning. <laughs> Pedagogus. It's a word that means, um, it, 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 in the Greek language, it was used of a trusted servant or a slave in a wealthy Roman home. It was a, a superintendent of the children. Try not to lose you here, but... It wasn't necessarily a teacher, but it was more like a nanny. It was someone who had the superintendent position over the children from the ages of 6 to 16. And so this nanny would care for the needs of the child and, 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 and was responsible for the child as the child grew. Responsible for their education indeed, but responsible for their well-being up until the point where they reached 16 years old and they now would uh, come into the father's inheritance. It was a schoolmaster that brought them to the place of adulthood. It served its purpose. It, and this is what Paul is saying. Paul, according to the foundations of Pentecostal theology... Paul had in mind the temporary and purely provisional nature of this arrangement until the child became of age and could participate, participate fully in the father's inheritance. In other words, 
Through the law, we are brought to the understanding of our need for grace. That's what the law did. It carried us along until we realized that we are in desperate need of grace. That we cannot fulfill the law. We cannot keep the law. And by the working of the law, we cannot please God. Because we, can, because we, because we keep failing. You with me so far? Amen. All right. Secondly, and there's only two points. <clears throat> what justification is. Sin is a separator from God. As illustrated in its original occurrence, Lucifer. Lucifer, by the way, was created the, to be an anointed cherub. If you look at Ezekiel 28, I believe this is speaking of Lucifer. He was a beautiful angel. One, I mean, he was, he was beautiful in, in, in God's creation until sin was found in his heart. Until he said, I will be like the Most High God. And God said, no, not on your life. And he was cast out of the presence of God, cast out of heaven, cast down to earth. And, and this anointed cherub who said, I will, was separated from the, the presence of God. Comes down to earth and messes with, you know, Adam and Eve. And, and here again, in the first occurrence on earth, here is Adam who was given charge over all the garden. You could have all the trees. You could do whatever you want. Enjoy yourself. Just do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then Adam said, and Eve said, we will. We will have the knowledge of good and evil. And so they ate of the tree, and God cast them out of the garden, separated from what... Adam used to walk with God in the cool of the eve, had fellowship with God. They spoke face to face, friend to friend, and God said, no, your sin has separated you, cast them out of the garden, um, and, sep and sin separated. And when that happened, sin, sin came into the world, sickness came into the world, pain, uh, death, sorrow came into the world, and sin separated from the presence of God. <clears throat> it's not human goodness, but God's law that is the standard. God doesn't, you know, you could say, well, I'm a good person. I look at my neighbor. My neighbor's a bad person. <laughs> but comparatively speaking, I'm pretty good. I, you know, I don't smoke or chew or run around with boys that do. You know, I, 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 don't, I, don't, uh, I don't hurt anybody. I don't steal anything. You know, I'm, I'm a good person. And, and, but you see, friends, the, the problem with that logic is your goodness, man's goodness, is not God's standard. Amen. His standard is his standard. His holy perfection is his standard. His law is his standard. And we fall short. His law is too lofty for us. In fact, he knows that we can't keep it. Paul, the apostle, says in our text here, By one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Romans 5.12 By one man, Adam. Now, the Bible doesn't make this clear exactly how this happened, just that it did. Some theologians call Adam the, f the federal head of mankind. In other words, he was the responsible party. And because he sinned uh, and we are born of Adam, uh, he was responsible and so we've inherited his sin because he was a federal head. Some theologians say that we were in the seed of Adam when he sinned, and so therefore we, we sinned when Adam sinned. I, to be honest with you, I don't understand. I don't understand. All I know is that the Bible says that because Adam sinned, sin has come in by one man. Sin has entered into the world, and so we have all sinned. That's a fact. That's a biblical fact. That is not to be debated in any way or f shape or form. You see, uh, you know this to be true. I don't know if we have any children in the nursery today, and I'm sorry if you're a parent or grandparent. I don't want to insult you in any way, but if you've ever seen children, uh, the first, first word is mama, second word dada, third word is mine, and fourth word is no. <laughs> and nobody ever taught them. Right? 
Well, nobody, you don't teach your kids, you don't have to teach your kids to sin. It, they, they do it quite, it's there, it's in them. We are born in sin. When, and, and it's a fact, you could see it, it's, 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 it's all over them. We inherited Adam. His nature we inherited, his sin we inherited, his guilt we inherited, his punishment we inherited. Don't just look at Adam, because guess what? Not just his sin, but our own sin. We have sinned. And, and, and we have fallen short of the glory of God, of the standard of God. And so we, we are in Adam, and, and because of this one man, sin came into the world. Listen, all that happens to Adam happens to us. Still with me? Amen. Adam sinned, we sinned. Adam, uh, sickness and death came upon Adam, sickness and death came upon us. Uh, he had to, or, uh, by the sweat of his brow did he make his living, and so by the sweat of your brow you will go to work tomorrow morning. What happens to Adam happens to us. And Adam was separated from the holy presence of God. And we are separated from the holy presence of God. Death, spiritual death and separation came into Adam's life. And so we die. And we, are, we die the second death. And hell and hell's flames awaits every single human being. We, we inherited Adam. That's the bad news. For if through the offense of one, many be dead, Adam, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. Romans 5.15 So those who are in Christ Jesus inherited his fate. What happens to Adam happens to us. If we're in Christ, what happens to Christ happens to us. To some degree. You with me? Jesus, this perfect, sinless Son of God, perfectly obeyed God, perfectly fulfilled the law. And so if we are in Christ, God looks upon us and he sees us through Christ. And he says, you have perfectly obeyed my law. Not in your own, but in Christ. The Bible says that we are accepted in the Beloved. So what happens to Christ? He, he, he's accepted, acceptable to the Father, and so he has made us acceptable to the Father. Jesus rose from the dead, and so if we're in Christ, we will rise from the dead. We have eternal life because of what Jesus has done for us. What happens to the second Adam, or the last Adam, Jesus Christ? happens to those. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. The Bible says we are seated with Him into heavenly places. He has made us acceptable to the Father. He has brought us, reconciled us into the presence of the Father. Listen. How is this done? How is that done? We who are sinners, who, who, who've broken the law, can't keep it. Justification through justification. Uh, this is a judicial, this is judicial, it is a legal transaction. What justification is not? Wow. <laughs> what justification is not? Romans chapter 3 verse 20 says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. No flesh can be justified in God's sight by keeping the law. No one is justified by attempting to keep the commandments. Why, listen to me, why is this so difficult? Why is it so difficult? Ten commandments, what, what the problem? Why can't we keep the commandments? I'm not going to steal anything. I'm not going to kill anybody. I'm not going to blaspheme my Lord. I'm not going to, you know, I, and you say, well, aren't it, look at the face, on the face of this. Shouldn't that be pretty easy? I mean, look at the, on the face of this, it's not a difficult thing. Don't 
Don't hurt anyone. Jesus summed it up in two words, two, two commandments. Love God with all your heart, body, mind, soul, everything you got, and love your neighbor as yourself. It's pretty easy because we all love ourselves. <laughs> and so it's pretty easy, except, except that Jesus said if you hate your brother, if you're angry at, at your brother without a cause, you hate your brother, uh, the, then, then you, you're guilty of murder. Because that same murder is just acting out what's in your heart. And so murder is in your heart, you're guilty of murder. Uh, he said if you look upon the opposite sex with a desire, lustfully, then you have created, created adultery in your heart. And so it's not a matter of, of going, it's, it's not a matter of the act, it's, it's there in your heart. And so, and, and, if, and if we blaspheme, to blaspheme is to use the Lord's name, take the Lord's name in vain. I mean, some silly joke, you know, that, that we find so harmless about, you know, uh, uh, whatever. The devil and God were, you know, in a room and, you know, whoa. Don't, God is not the butt of any joke. He doesn't belong in a joke. Okay, so that's taking his name in vain. And so we're, we're busted. We, 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 we can't keep, we cannot keep his law. And so all the commandments can do is, is show us that we are sinners. And the more one tries to keep them, the more sinful they become. You still with me? Amen. The more we try, okay, well, but tomorrow I'm going to get up and tomorrow I'm going to be better. Tomorrow I'm going to do everything. I'm going to prove to God that I'm, that I'm good. And, you know, five minutes down the road, you, you know, you already lost it. And so what the law does, the more we try and keep it, it shows us just how much we can't keep it. So don't even try to, to prove your righteousness by fulfilling the law because you're only going to become more, uh, more of a lawbreaker. So the wages of sin, the Bible says, the wages of sin is death. Punishment for our sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, Romans 6.23. We have all been pronounced guilty before our great judge. And the payment for our sin is the second death. Eternal flames await all of us and there's nothing we can do. We stand before a judge, and the, gr the gavel has dropped. Guilty. You know, you were, you were in a bank. You robbed the bank. There's cameras on every angle, every angle. They got the back of your head, the front of your head, the side. There's one right up in your face. Uh, you left your DNA because you had a cut finger, and blood was all over the counter. They got you. Fingerprints everywhere. Ten people in the bank that know you personally. They all attested. <laughs> it was, you're, you're done. Guilty. You have no defense. You have no defense. The gavel's dropped. Guilty as charged. But in comes someone. See, in our case, it's Jesus. And he says, I, guilt, yeah, okay, Charges, guilty, guilty is charged. There's no, there's no arguing that. That's, um, but he is innocent. In fact, he is the only innocent man. Can I, can I just tell you something? He is the only one who was immaculately conceived. <laughs> he was the only one that was born sinless. He was the only one that lived sinless. He is the only one who could pay the price. You see... It's not just the death of Jesus Christ. It's not just the death of a man in our place that purchased for us our, our justification before God. If that were the case, either one of the thieves on the cross on either side of him could have done that. But the fact is, he was the only one who fulfilled the law. He's the only one who kept the law. He's the only one who didn't break the law who kept it perfectly, who then could offer himself as payment for the breaking of the law. Because even the nicest person, greatest person on earth, all of their lives, even as good as they may appear to be, their lives are tainted with sin. And so our very best 
The Bible says our righteousness is as filthy rags. We stand before him clothed in filthy rags. And we're saying, God, look at how wonderful I am. There's nothing we could provide that will satisfy that, that debt, that law. We broke the law, we're guilty. Jesus is the only one who was perfectly sinless, who fulfilled the law, who kept the law. And so he steps in and says, Father, I will pay the price. I will be, I will take the sentence for that. For those people, I will take their, sh their guilt, I will take their shame, I'll take the pain, I'll take the punishment, I will, I will die in their place as, in, instead of them, let it be me. And he offers himself in our place. He who knew no sin became sin, literally the sin offering, that we might be made the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 5.21 and upon the fulfillment of the payment for sin, we're free to go. Get the picture? Amen. Are we innocent? Not on your life. Guilty as charged. You ever notice in it? Well, anyway, I'll get back to that. The debt is paid and justice is satisfied. Justice is satisfied. The debt is paid and so... Uh, and so we're free to go. Are we then holy, righteous, and sanctified? No. That's a work of the Holy Spirit. We'll talk about that perhaps in a couple of weeks. We, that's a work of the Holy Spirit. Justification is a work of Christ alone. He stood there at the bar of God. He stood there at the judge. And, and he alone took our sin and our punishment upon himself. Uh, is it a pardon? Are we pardoned? No. Listen to what Charles Hodge says in the Systematic Theology. When a sovereign pardons a criminal, it is not an act of justice. It is not on the ground of satisfaction to the law. When a, ju when a, when a, a, a governor or the president pardons somebody, justice has not been served. Punishment has not been paid. The debt has not been paid. They're, 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 they're freed on mercy. They're freed on grace, perhaps. But God, being the perfect judge, cannot let somebody go free without the price being paid. Justice must be served. And so our justification is not a pardon. He can't just say, because I, I love you, I'm going to let you go. No, Jesus died in our place. The, the payment was made. I'm almost done. Romans chapter 5 verse 1. We're going to look at these two verses. Verse 1 and verse 2 and then we'll be done. Paul says, Therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is what caused Martin Luther to protest. Protestants. Protestants. And to, and to, and to and the birth of the Reformation against the Roman Catholic Church that said, no, through works, through works and penance and payment, you could be saved. Come back on Sunday night and hear the rest. Uh, he protested against this and said, no, by grace, uh, uh, through faith, it, we are justified by faith, not through works. It, it birthed the Ref Reformation. Kenneth Wiest, in his word studies in the Greek New Testament, said, the context is didactic. It contains a definite statements of fact. It is highly doctrinal in nature. Listen, it has to do with the sinner's standing before God in point of law, not his experience. As James Denny, Expositor's Greek Testament says, the justified have peace with God. His wrath no longer threatens them. They are accepted in Christ. It is not a change in their feelings, which is indicated, but a change in God's relation to them. Still with me? Justification is not because you changed your mind. That's repentance, which is important, part of this. But justification is not because you changed your mind. Justification is not because you turned over a new leaf. Justification doesn't happen because you said, okay, God, from this point on, I'm going to serve you. That's not justification. Justification is not a work that you did at all. It was wrought by Jesus Christ alone. Important that you understand this. Romans chapter 5 and verse 2 says, By whom we also have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. 
access, that word access, pros agoge in Greek. Pros means with, face to face with. Um, uh, agoge means to bring. In other words, to bring face to face. We have access. Uh, it is used of a person who brings another into the presence of a third party. Okay, hold steady. You with me? We have access by Jesus Christ. It's not just that Jesus opened the door. He did that. It, it, it's not even that Jesus is the door and, and he is that. But what Jesus did by him dying on the cross and paying our price uh, for our sin, he, he has brought us into the presence of God the Father. It's like this, I say, Lisa, come with me. Come with me, Lisa, and I take her hand and I bring her right into the presence of God and I say, uh, Father, this is, this is what Jesus did. The, I brought this one. Father, I brought her. Uh, will you accept her? And, and God says, for you, son, because you have perfectly fulfilled my, 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 what I've given you to do. Uh, yes, I will on your behalf. I will accept her. She's accepted in you. And so now Lisa is free to come into the presence of God. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Didn't she break the law? Isn't she guilty? <laughs> no, she's justified. She, she could stand before the Father because her, her debt was paid in full and Jesus paid it. And so he takes her and he gives her access. He brings her face to face into the presence of God the Father. Now here's what happens for those who desire to work their way in. Who say, no, I'm good. You know, that's all wonderful, but I'm going to be good. I'm going to keep the commandments. I'm going to keep the law. I'm going to do what I, what I have to do, and God's going to be pleased with me. What it is, in, 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 send, in essence, is saying, thank you very much, Jesus, but um, I'll do this myself. I got this one myself. My friends, the Bible says that there remains no other sacrifice. If the payment was made, the only payment that could be made, the only one who could stand before God, and he's done that on your behalf, and now he brings you into his presence. If you say, no, thank you, I would rather work this out myself. There's no payment for sin. There's nothing. You're, you're, you're still in your sin, and there's nothing. You're, you, you can't enter his presence. Listen to what the Bible says. No, what I did was I missed the most important part of this in Romans 8, 8 verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus because of what Jesus has done. And if we reject that, then Galatians 5, 4. Christ is become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. Kenneth Wiest says one could translate it this way, you have become unaffected by Christ. The one, the only one, the perfect one who came to die in your place, the only one who fulfilled the law of God, the only one who can purchase you, who has purchased for you access into the presence of God the Father, and, and, and he is of none effect. All that he's done is, has no effect on you because you choose to work it out yourself then the, the blood of Jesus Christ, the death of the Son of God, the resurrection from the dead is of none effect. It, it, it hasn't affected you at all. You're still right where you were trying to satisfy the debt of, of sin. and You must, you have put yourself in a place where you must keep the whole law. Charles Hodge, finally, he says the meritorious, and, and this you're going to hear, you're going to hear this and then we're going to, we'll be done. The meritorious ground of justification is not faith. Hear me, don't, I'm not a heretic. The meritorious ground of justification is not faith. We are not justified on account of our faith. You say, wait a minute, doesn't the Bible say by faith you are, yeah, 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 hang, hang on. Considered as a virtuous or holy act or state of mind, nor are our works of any kind the ground of justification. Nothing done by us or wrought in us satisfies the demands of justice or can be the ground or reason of the declaration that justice, as far as it concerns us, is satisfied. 
Faith is involved in receiving it indeed. It's a work of the Holy Spirit, but the work of justification is completed by Christ alone. Let me just clear this up. What this means is this. God doesn't, God doesn't say, oh, oh, you have faith? Well, then you're justified. I have decided this morning that I will believe in God, and so uh, God says, oh, wonderful, then, then you are justified. No, I know, I know, it, 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 see, if that were the case, then it's my decision, it's my choice, it's my faith. And, and I have merited my justification by virtue of my faith. Do you, do you understand that? There is absolutely nothing that you or I could do to merit justification. It is something that Jesus Christ has done. Now, the Holy Spirit gives us that measure of faith by which we reach out and accept it. And say, oh, justification? I, I believe that. I'll, I'll have that. Do you follow me? But, but, it, but it's not. And, and so we are justified by faith that God has given us. But we haven't merited justification. The point is, point is so incredibly important. There is nothing, nothing, no thing that you or I could do to merit our justification. It was done when Jesus died. In conclusion... We are all guilty before God. The wages of our sin is death. Eternal punishment awaits all of us. The law proves our guiltiness. The evidence stacks up against us. The more we attempt to prove our own righteousness, the more of the law we break. We're pronounced guilty by the judge of all the earth. The gavel has dropped. And at our sentencing, Jesus steps in. He fulfills the legal demands of the law. Uh, the Bible says in Colossians 2.14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Jesus nailed our sin to the cross. He took our, the handwriting of ordinances. He took the, the law that we broke, our, our, our guiltiness, and he, he moved it out of the way. And it doesn't matter how we feel. You say, well, Pastor, this, I have to do something. I mean, it just stands to reason. If I'm going to have such a wonderful gift, eternal life from God, I, I have to do something. I gotta, I've got to I've gotta do something. I've got to live righteous. I've got to help people. I've got to feed the hungry. I've got to kneel on rice. I don't know. I've I got to do something. There's nothing you can do. What are you going to do? What are you, what are you going to do? <laughs> what are you going to do? There's nothing you could do. Because everything you attempt is tainted by your sin. And unacceptable to God. No, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter that you feel uh, that, you, that you, have to, you have to do something. Listen, Hodge says, in condemnation, it is a judge who pronounces sentence on the guilty. God said you're guilty. In justification, it is a judge who pronounces or declares the person arraigned, free from guilt, and entitled to be treated as righteous. The judge has pronounced that you are no longer uh, guilty. You are, you are not to be treated as guilty because the price has been paid. Well, wait a minute. But I don't feel that way. Well, friends, some days you're going to feel it. Some days you're not. Some days you get the bear. Some days the bear gets you. Some days you're high, some days you're low. Some days are good, some days are bad. Some days you feel righteous. Some days you don't. All of those things, sanctification, holiness, all of those things are acts of the Holy Spirit. And yes, we must, and we'll talk about that, we must respond to the Holy Spirit. And yes, all of those things are necessary in our Christian walk. Uh, absolutely. But none of those things merit for us salvation. Not one of those things causes us to be justified. Righteousness, sanctification, holiness come to a greater or lesser degree as we respond to the Holy Spirit and His work. Justification is. Listen. Justification is not something that we have to keep coming back for. Justification is not something that we have to keep coming to check on. We don't have to, we don't have to come back and say, well, I'm no longer justified. I've got to come back. No. The judge has pronounced you 
free to go. Payment in full. There's no, there's no more payments once. Once and for all, the payment is made. You are either justified by what Christ has done, or you're not justified. And if you're justified, then you're justified by what Christ has done. Now we'll talk about, don't, don't misunderstand me. Um, I, I don't believe in unconditional eternal security, but justification remains. Listen, in our court system, there is a law called the law of double jeopardy. You familiar with that? You cannot be tried by the same crime twice. And so if you were, if you were tried in a court of law and, they, and there wasn't enough evidence, they released you, uh, you were, you've, been, you've been determined to be not guilty, your justice was served by the, by the law and you're free to go. Now, it doesn't matter if, how you feel or what you... You have been pronounced not guilty and you're free to go. Maybe you, were, maybe you were pronounced guilty and you went to jail and you paid your fine uh, and the fine is paid. When you get out, they can't try you again. You are, you, justice has been served. You cannot be tried for the same crime twice. Notice when you, when, not when you, hopefully it will never be you, but when people stand before the judge and the, and, and the judge pronounces them not guilty, notice they never say innocent. Well, you're innocent. No, you're not guilty. And in essence, what they're saying is there was not enough evidence against you to find you guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. And so, friends, because of what Jesus has done, when we acknowledge what he has done for us and we have come in Christ, the, all the evidence against us has been washed away by his blood. His, there's no evidence against us. It's all been cast into the sea of his forgetfulness. We have been declared to be uh, not guilty, justified by what he has done, and the evidence is gone. That's justification. His blood has washed away all evidence of our guilt. Where are you this morning? Are you trying in your own strength to, to, to be pleasing enough to God to get into heaven? I'm keeping the Ten Commandments. I, I'm, I'm keeping the law. I, I'm a good person. You know, surely my goodness will get me there. My, my goodness, I'm better than my neighbor. I'm better than most people. I'm, my goodness, friends... Your works, the works of the law, will, 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 no, will no flesh justify. The only justification, the only power, the only way we could stand before a holy God is through the blood of Jesus Christ, through the meritorious work of Jesus Christ upon the cross. Do you know him? Have you bowed your knee to him and said, Lord, upon that, upon what you have done for me, I stand. Not by my own works. I, I confess that I am a sinner. Your law tells me that I'm a sinner and there's nothing I can do about it. And I acknowledge today, Lord, there's nothing I can do about my sin. I'm separated from you. I understand that the wages of my sin is death, separation for eternity, and I have no claim to it. I have no plea. I'm done. But I acknowledge what Jesus did. I acknowledge that he, that he went to the cross. I acknowledge that he was perfect. And that he, he died in my place and that you were pleased with him. And because of what he has done, I, I, I want, by faith, I want to accept that. By faith, I want to reach out and take my, I want to take that justification that he purchased for me. I, I want to stand before you. Are you. Is that you this morning? Is there anybody here this morning that, and you would say, I, I need that. I need to be restored to the Father. I need the justification that Christ has purchased for me. I, I realize that I can't do it on my own. And I need Jesus. Is there anyone here this morning? You just, your eyes are wide open. Your heads are, 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 are fully alert. But you know that you need Jesus. Then would you just raise your hand? Okay. You child of God. We're going we're to talk about holiness. Last week I talked about the narrow road. It's a narrow road. And it will always be a narrow road. Obedience to God is, it, it, it is not an option. We must obey. Sanctified, yes, we must be. Holy, yes, without holiness we will not see God. All of those things flow from a life that has been justified. Don't think for a moment that any of those things will cause us to be justified before the Father. 
Doesn't matter how you feel. Some days are good, some days are bad. But did Jesus die for you? Are you acknowledging his work on the cross? Then you are justified before the Father. Father, we love you, God. And we are so very grateful for what you have done. If it were up to us, Lord, we fail every day. Over and over and over and over again. And the harder we try, Lord, it seems the more we fail. And, and Lord, the, the enemy comes and he condemns us. He tells us that, that you are not pleased with us. That there's no way that you can ever be happy.